All right, hello everyone. This is my video to talk about bathtub water. This is a deck I piloted to second place at American Continentals that was hosted by Cascadia, an event run by uh, Eric Whiteblade and Sam Radiant. Uh, and they had a whole bunch of other help. I had a ton of fun. You should go and look at the write-up in my description. Uh, if you're watching it this week, you can also look at CTZ's great decks, which are called The Worm and Go To Cascadia, along with Rongi Dodge's uh, Corp List, which is called uh, Have You Seen This Man? And uh, this was just an event that's been honestly probably the, the highlight of my Netrunner career for me, at least so far, in terms of fun, in terms of performance. This has just been, uh, this was an amazing event. And I think the deck I brought to this event was really, really good, at least at the time of this event. We're going to talk about how meta has evolved a little bit in the week and a half since this list uh, came in second. Um, but I think this list is really cool. I've put a ton of effort into it, and I want to make a video talking about it because a lot of times when people see op, they say, oh, that's going to be too complex for me to play. And I think the cool thing about this list is it's really, to me, a fundamentals of Netrunner list. You're just doing it out of a completely weird ID. So without further ado, I will just quickly show, yes, I did in fact come in uh, second place. This is the uh, always be running standings here on the right. Uh, I came in second with Op and Arasana. I was originally gonna try and do Op and Arasana in a single video, but decided that, you know, Op can give it get its own video. And my Arasana list, I think is, um, this event was much clunkier, but still I think pretty cool and strong. So maybe I'll make some video about that in the future kind of your pretty basic op. So if, you, if you're not familiar, op is this idea that says whenever you trash a res card, except during installation, uh, you may search R&D for a card with a printed res cost of exactly one less than the trash card. You can install it, ignoring all credit costs. So this is a lot of text on the ID. The way I can compartmentalize it in my brain is I say, if I trash a card through a card ability, so the big target in the deck is you know, the only way I actually have to do it in the deck, independent of a card's own ability, is extract, which just said, allows me to trash a card. So if I extract a card, I get to go and get a cost that's one credit down. Um, so if I have something like an envelopment, uh, which you'll notice I'm running three of in this list, and I'll talk about, you know, why in a little bit, um, I can get something like a border control, um, which costs four credits. And that's basically the idea is that this deck is going to try and use that ability for just a little bit of extra leverage. But this is not a deck that's built around constantly using the op ability to set up some sort of combo or winning board state. Instead, this, uh, this identity is trying to do what I think of as the quintessential Tempo Netrunner. I think if you want to play a, another version of Tempo Netrunner, CTZ's deck, go to Cascadia, his ASA list, is also fantastic, just fundamentals, tempo, netrunner on the corpse side in the year of our Lord 2023. The reason that I like tempo as a strategy in the corp meta right now is because of some of the pressures that exist on the runner side. So the way I'm looking at the game at the moment, you know, immediately post the Automata initiative release is that runners have an enormous late game advantage. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, but basically right now, um, K2CP Turbine um, is a card that is seeing some actual play. Um, oops. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons for this. K2CP Turbine is actually not, I think the primary reason, but it's one of the, these really powerful tools that runners have at the moment that allow them to go very greedy in the end game. And what we're seeing a lot of right now is breakers like Cleaver, uh, which have high base strength, but poor boost to break and buzzsaw a lot as well. Um, so these cards have come into the meta with the rotation of the bin breakers, which most notably for this deck were cards like Paperclip and Black Orchestra um, and MK Ultra. Um, these three cards allowed Anarch to basically not have to pre-install their breakers. They only had to install a breaker if it was relevant for their ability to break the piece of ice you were running. Um, but 
with these three breakers gone, now every single runner faction, with some asterisks there, needs to install some set of breakers before they can get through your ice. This means that uh, the breakers that they have printed right now are some of the most historically strong breakers that have ever existed. If you look at something like Unity as well, uh, again, a system gateway breaker, this is some of the best boost break stats you can ever get. Echelon is like a shockingly good uh, killer in the late game. So runners have access to a lot of really powerful end game icebreakers. They also have access to a lot of really strong economic recovery tools. So things like Creative Commission, Carpe Diem, uh, Fermenter uh, are all allow each faction to very efficiently and quickly go from low credit totals back up into the teens of credit totals without having to spend too much time. I had wrote up some notes for myself and I said, yeah, probably you, I usually expect the, the runner to be able to go from about zero credits to about 15 credits in about three turns. Uh, and that can vary depending on the runner, depending on the faction, depending on the board state, obviously. But you're not really able to keep the runner out of having a lot of money for a long time. Now, runners do have a somewhat finite economy, which has not always been true of all states of Netrunner. Um, so there is a strategy of corpse style where you just go really long. You try and grind out the runner and exhaust the resources before you exhaust out your own. I personally don't like playing that style. So... Uh, the other thing is I think that style has some inherent disadvantages to the hyper-efficient rigs that runners are trying to run. So the type of corpse that I like to try and run in this meta, you have options. You have combo kill options, which is what ultimately won the event. Um, and then you also have like tag and bag options, which I think are slightly different from combo kill, though you can definitely kind of group those in the same thing. But the other thing that I really um, like playing is tempo scoring decks. These are decks that try and score at whenever a window opens. And the window is usually not very large. It's sometimes just a turn. Sometimes it's not even really a full window. And I'm going to talk and show, show what that looks like in a replay at the end of this video. Um, but the idea is this is a scoring deck. This is a deck that is looking to score agendas. And that's it. It's going to have a couple of cool skateboard tricks, but it doesn't actually need them, as, as you can see in CTC's list. The goal is just to be moving a little bit ahead of where the runner can get to, and you'll open up just enough space to sneak an agenda through every now and again. So what are the challenges for tempo decks? Well, the first one is kind of an inherent gameplay thing. When I think of tempo decks, I, they are usually going to install some number of their agendas, usually between two and three agendas, uh, and sometimes as many as, as all four agendas, onto the board and protect them for a turn before they go and score them. They're trying to get some form of momentum from that score. They're trying to disrupt the runner's ability to like get in and intervene in that score, but they're leaving them on the board where the runner can know that is an agenda. Sometimes they're even advancing it, as is very common in this deck. Um, and so they have to come, you know, for a long time, or like in very, very early Netrunner, you could like install an agenda behind an ice wall and be reasonably confident the runner would have to have their barrier breaker in hand to get through. But in modern Netrunner, that's no longer the case. There's a suite of what I call the B tools. Maybe you could even call them the BS tools, but I generally like what they do for the game, so I'm not going to go too hard on that. Um, which are Botulus, Boomerang, Bankar, and then just generic Bypass. All four of these things allow the runner to get through single pieces of ice really efficiently. So this has been one of the ongoing problems that tempo decks try have to figure out solutions for is if the runner has one of those four tools and most runners are packing two to six copies of those tools in their deck, how do I you how do I make early scoring windows matter for me? And I think the cool thing that this op deck does is it has a bunch of different answers for how those work. So I'm gonna actually maybe go through uh, this list a little bit card by card to talk about uh, which of these, why each of these cards are in the list and then where you could maybe think about cutting them. Arguably the most important agenda in this deck is Oaktown Renovation. 
This looks very deceptive to be the most important agenda in the deck, but finding an Oaktown renovation early and scoring it ends up being a huge part of the momentum of this deck because Oaktown actually is tempo positive while you're attempting to score it. It doesn't even have to be scored for you to have done something to advance your board state. And hopefully, if the runner does steal it, they spent more than you did trying to protect it. And that ends up being something that happens pretty commonly as I talk about the ice suite later in the game. The other killer agenda in this list is Project Atlas. Uh, Project Atlas has been basically a mainstay. It's hard to believe this wasn't in the core set of Netrunner. It feels like one of the core cards for Wayland. Um, but this agenda, being either a blank 3-2 or a 3-2 that allows you to tutor for any card from your list, is one of the most powerful ways to take a sh sh early game scoring window and expand it into an end game win. Because being able to tutor cards from your deck, pull whichever exact one you need, is really important. Hostile Takeover is um, also quite good in the list, honestly. Uh, just giving you credits ends up being really good. And when we talk about Takana, this card will also come up again when we talk about Takana. The rest of the agendas are a little bit given, you know, take them or leave them. I think something like Above the Law is, you know, sometimes you're happy to see this. Mostly this is played because it's another 3-2. Same story for Azef Protocol. Sometimes this lets you do op kick flips, but a lot of the time you don't really care about it. The final agenda here is uh, Slash and Burn Agriculture. And this one I ended up talking about in the write-up, not feeling great about, but I think we uh, there's some interesting decks, and I'll link it in the description from NWE, where they show that you can actually lean into this even more and potentially get more value out of it. I found this pretty lackluster on the day, and it probably could have just been another OSF protocol. So we have these agendas, but now we need to be able to score them. And so now we get to probably just the most important card. Well, actually, I think this might secretly be the second most important card in the deck. This is Border Control. Border Control is just a four cost barrier with a single strength and it says gain a credit for each piece of ice breaking the server and then end the run. But the important thing or one of the most important things is that trash can ability at the top, which is trash can and the run uses ability only during a run on this server. So in op, we can fire this border control and then search for a three cost card from our deck. And we have a bunch of three costs that we want to get. So the most common gameplay or one of the most common gameplay patterns for this deck is to install an agenda. Honestly, something like a Oaktown renovation is great. You advance the Oaktown renovation and then you install a border control in front of it. And this actually ends up meaning that the runner basically needs two card combos to even try and contest your one card remote. That's a huge win for you. Not because you're always going to be able to score, but because you're asking, you're forcing your opponent to have more cards that they have to commit and generally more resource that they have to commit than you're committing. And so you're just trying to trade up in terms of this tempo, in terms of cards spent and resources spent, and hope that you can kind of keep accelerating and pushing the pressure on the, on the runner so that they just can't keep up. Border Control is a great tool for this. One of the most common things, there's two cards that I tutor for the most often. The first one was a Sandstone. And I think actually one of the things I'd look to make a change in this deck is getting a third Sandstone in the deck. Because Sandstone is a powerhouse card right now. Most people are not ready to deal with a five strength three to res barrier. If you're looking at running into this with a Cleaver, it's gonna cost you a crap ton of money. It generally costs you five credits the first time you try and break a sandstone. That's really good. And you'll be resetting that sandstone because it turns out this deck purges a lot for reasons we'll talk about later. Um, the other card that I was getting was Magnet. And the reason you you include Magnet or in this list is less so for direct Trojan hate of Arasana, which is very popular in the meta at the moment, but for getting Botulus. Um, being able to score behind a Magnet turn one against Anarch is actually like a thing that you can do because Magnet exists, um, because they can't usually just install Bot... If they install Botulus on the Magnet and make a run, you're pretty happy uh, because they actually can't break it. This Sometimes you can do the same play against Arasana if they're trying to run aggressively with a Slap Vandal. Um, 
And so this, these are the most common things your border control will go into. But the highest value thing your border control can go into is Mavirus. Part of the reason I actually think this deck is really good right now is basically every runner is on, th on a Virus card. So if you're Criminal, you're playing Amakua. If you're Anarch, you're playing Amakua. If you're Shaper, you're probably playing Amakua. Uh, Amakua is just everywhere in the meta right now, and for good reason. Basically, most of its natural predators are gone, particularly in the form of IP block, uh, which just rotated with Flashpoint. And it's very efficient. There's lots of runners who can make early runs that are just kind of poking and getting a little bit of extra value on that base strength of a breaker. Makes a lot of corp rush plans really, really fragile. And rush is one of the strongest kind of baseline strategies if you're a runner who's playing lots of greedy things like cleaver buzzsaw turbine unity echelon like those are greedy cards that are playing for a late game and so amakua allows you to apply pressure in the early game to then let you pivot into these late game strong cards so mavirus because we are an early game tech lets us exploit players that are relying on a virus based card to deal with that now also i was expecting a lot of fermenters uh, Fermenter is a really strong econ card in Anarch. Being able to purge this for one click instead of three clicks is huge when we're trying to go fast. We care way more about going fast than spending three credits. And sometimes we're going to have spent those four credits on the border control, turn those into Mavirus, and then turn this Mavirus into a two cost card. Um, the reason I say Mavirus is the best two cost or three cost card to grab when you can afford to is because it itself will then trigger down the chain. So as long as you get some value out of the Mavirus being on the board, you then get to turn it into even more value into getting what I think is possibly the most important card in the deck and the card I would love to find a spot for a third copy of. This is Tukana. Tukana is a brand new card in the Automata initiative. It says remote server only, and this is persistent whenever an agenda is scored or stolen from the from the root of the server, you can search R&D for a piece of ice and install and res it, paying three less. So Tukana is the upgrade, I think that, well, there's two things that I think took this deck from being okay to good uh, in the Parhelion meta to I think one of the best options that you can bring, which I still kind of my opinion, even though this deck did not show up super high at Europe, uh, the Europe, Middle East, and Africa continentals. Um, Tukana basically allows you to take your agendas, which were already mostly tempo positive, and put even more pressure onto the board state and even more pressure onto the runner. One of the challenges that rush decks will have is they can build a scoring remote, but they can't protect centrals. And Tukana basically allows you to do both at the same time. As we're going to see in the game that I play, I fire Tukana a couple of times, and I basically always actually use the Tukana trigger to shore up my centrals. Because I'm scoring out of a remote, well, my remote's already pretty good. If a runner is stealing an agenda out of my Tukana remote, well, then maybe I will put an ice on the Tukana on my scoring remote to make it harder for them to get in the next time, and I can go back in. So Dakana ends up being this really strong powerhouse card. The other thing it lets us do is say we have an extract in hand and we want to set up a new chain. We can go and pull the card that's going to help set us up on the chain. Um, I would say during the event at Cascadia, almost all my Dakana triggers went onto R&D. I would maybe do one trigger to the remote at most a game, and then most of my other triggers would go onto R&D, sometimes onto Archives or HQ to ice it up to protect myself against an Amakua that was getting in danger of getting out of control. But we have other two cost cards. So one of the ones is Managarm. And a lot of people in the deck list write up said, hey, if you're gonna run Managarm and Op, you should also run Formicary. To me, that's not really the point. Uh, as we talk about, when I talk about the ice in some detail, really the ice is there to be always good. When you draw the ice, you wanna say, great, I drew this ice, I know exactly where this goes right now. And from my experience testing Formicary in the Barhelion meta, it was so often a card I would draw and go, shit, I can't do anything with this card. Um, Managarm, though, to me, is a great second two cost because we can only have one Tukana active at a time, but a Managarm 
means that the runner is super compressed in terms of the resources that they're gonna to spend to get into our remote. Now, it's not impossible, it's in fact not uncommon for the runner to be able to pay the Managarm tax. Usually five credits, usually they don't actually have the clicks to spend. And so if they're spending eight credits to deal with my two cost upgrade, I should probably be able to exploit some window that's created from them spending that much money. If I can't, well, I've probably lost the game anyway. It's just kind of a part of the deck building that I've accepted. Sometimes Forma Carry is going to be that force multiplier, but I found that generally I didn't need the force multiplier on my scoring remote. I needed something to help me protect centrals. Uh, and so actually I end up installing Managarm on centrals quite a bit, uh, but Forma Carry just kind of never ended up making sense to me. So I've talked a lot about the two, co I got distracted, you know, I went from agendas to border control to these, to my virus, to these two cost upgrades that are really crucial to the deck. I'm gonna go back to the ice for a second and talk about all of the other places. So envelopment is the card that I've seen the people dropping the most. And to be honest, it's the drop that makes the least sense to me. I think three envelopments is probably too many. But at the same time, I think Envelopment is one of the best pieces of ice for this deck specifically because it more or less always opens up a window. It costs the runner a ton of credits to deal with Envelopment or it costs them a trick in a couple of cases. Against Arasana, Envelopment's pretty dead. So if you're expecting a lot of Arasana, uh, Envelopment becomes a little bit dicier. But Envelopment ends up being a 5-strength, five 5-subroutine five barrier most of the time. And that is some really good stats. If you res this in the early game, it is generally correct for the runner to bounce off of this and let you have whatever is in the remote. And that's exactly what I want out of a piece of ice. The fact that this ice doesn't scale into the late game is fine. We're not looking to get into the super late game. We also, because Envelopment trashes itself, it can get us a border control. One thing to note, and I actually didn't know this until after Cascadia finished, if the runner breaks all the end the runs and you have a border control that's resed protecting the same server as the envelopment, you can pop the border control before the envelopment trash this ice subroutine fires. So if your envelopment has like all four of its subroutines and the runner is like, okay, I'm gonna cleaver up, I'm gonna spend, four credits to match strength, I'm gonna spend two credits to break, so I spent six credits. Aha, now your ice is gonna trash, and then I'm gonna break your border control for one credit, and then I've gotta, you know, I'm gonna be able to break whatever you pop, fetch with your border control. You can actually, you can preemptively pop the border control so they have to break that envelopment for six credits again. And that's a good way to actually get a lot of value out of an envelopment. But generally I found envelopment it was just, it said five credits, boom, stop the run. And usually it stopped the run for two or three turns, which is an enormous window in this deck. Usually you're just trying to find, you're just looking to find a window of one turn where you can get some get some damage down. Um, so to me, I'm really high on envelopment. Uh, I saw Lost Geek and NWE. I always call them that way. NWE also was playing an op. They were very high on ice walls. I'm a little bit less high on it. I think it just doesn't do some of the work I want my cards to do where it just dies too easily to too much tech. Uh, in particular, Amaku is really bad for it. Um, I'm running two magnets because as I said before, I want to be able to turn my border controls into code gates. That way I can force the runner to have to have two different tools to go and actually uh, handle my ice. So if they run early, they you know, if they, if they just slam down a cleaver, run my border control, I can make them pay for it and then pop the border control, slam down the magnet, and now they have to have a second type, a second tool in hand to go and deal with my, my single ice remote. And that's a huge point of power for this deck. The one of whoredom um, is basically sometimes I want to sell an envelopment but not get a border control right away or I just want extra four cost. The other part about it that's nice is it's a relatively high strength code gate, which makes it kind of just playable sometimes. Uh, it's annoying for Buzzsaw to break a Hordum, which is basically the most I can ask for of most code gates at the moment. Um, Afshar honestly felt like it was really good in the previous meta where you were making Black Orchestra users spend five to go through. Uh, that, so they usually end up having to put a botulus on your Afshar. 
it feels less good when your opponent's only spending one credit to break the one sub and then losing two. So this is actually a card I definitely think about cutting or changing into something potentially like an Enigma. Um, again, I'm liking two cost I two strength ice a little bit more than one and zero strength ice right now because of how strong Amakua is, even in our deck with three Mephiruses. Uh, that said, white space uh, is an exception to this because it is basically the only two cost card I can find in the card pool that I want to run that sometimes does something. This is an annoying card for the runner to face check on the number of board states and will do a job for a little bit of time while running. Now, you'll also see in my list, I have half from in this list. This is a card that you pretty much reserve for special situations. The cool thing about this card is how it interacts with Stavka in particular. I'm gonna talk about Stavka first, then we're gonna go back to Halfrun. So Stavka just says, when you resist ice, you may trash another of your installed cards. If you do, this ice gains five strength for the remainder of the run, and then trash a program, trash a program. So at four to res, this is pretty hefty. And if you're trashing a card, you're like going tempo negative, unless you're using your op to then go and search for a new card, in which case you're probably coming out in, in the wash there. A seven strength trash two programs is really annoying. The most common breakers I saw were Carmen, uh, which is gonna break this for, uh, it's gonna have to boost twice. So it's gonna break this for six and Echelon, which is gonna break this for even more, even if all three breakers are down, you're still breaking this actually, yeah, you're breaking this for eight, which is like often so expensive that the runner just lets Stavka fire. Um, now, this is like a key part of this deck. I can't make that many sentries matter. There's not end the run sentries that I really want to run, but making the runner install their breakers and then lose their breakers is a great way for me to open up a scoring window. This deck isn't really trying to lock out the runner. I assume that most good runner decks will have enough tricks that the lockout's just not actually possible, but Stavka will hit their tempo and slow down their ability to sneak away centrals or sneak away remote accesses. So Stavka can actually go on every server. The most important thing is you put it on the server that the runner is going to run. That's the key thing with Stavka. Um, if the runner wants to run that server, that's a good server for Stavka to go on. Um, now, the fun interaction that probably a lot of you are aware of, but maybe not all of you, is that Half Run uh, lets you discard a card to turn off a breaker. And you can do this to the runner's sentry breaker. And if you do this during, you can basically do this as the runner is approaching the Stavka. So when you res the Stavka, if you trash a three cost card, you can search your deck for the Half Run, install the Half Run on the server protecting that also is a Stavka, discard a card from your hand, resolve the half run effect, and then you get to resolve Stavka almost all the time for free. You can also, even if they're just running a Stavka that's already res on the board, you can pop a virus to search for the half run and do the exact same trick. And a lot of the time, that's enough to take out a lot of the runner's rig. Now, you can make the whole deck about this half, half run Stavka trick. You can go up to three Stavkas, you can go up to two half runs. The thing that my impression of that was, though I didn't test it myself extensively, is that if the runner is on tricks, and a lot of runners are on tricks, you're spending four influence and five card slots to not always be like to on a trick that only works against kind of the mid tier of runner decks. The best runner decks have tricks and can play, can play assuming they're going to lose their breakers at some point and kind of recover from them afterwards. The last ice I have in here is actually, uh, I found to be a like an unsung hero in the list, Tithe. Just being a two credits to break on a one cost piece of ice or you gain money, which is like super helpful for this deck. The net damage is whatever, but runners kind of need every card. Like they're trying to play, a te you're playing a tempo race game. And so them losing the cards they spend drawing is also good for you. Um, Tithe you just get when you sell off a two cost card, which happens every now and again. Um, and I just wanted to have an extra one coster in the deck. So in terms of other stuff that's in the deck, Rashida auto include in every deck. Regolith Mining License, sometimes the deck needs a little bit of money, so going and having uh, an extra 
two credit target from a virus is really good. Spin Doctor, this deck chews up its ice. This deck is running 17 ice, and often I would get to the end of the game and have removed all of the ice from my deck. Um, so yeah, I'd, you want to do a lot of recursion in this. 1x Audacity, I would love to get this to 2x Audacities uh, because it makes your scoring out plan very consistent against Anarch and Criminal. Extract is the most important card in this deck. You cannot cut Extracts. It is the best eco. Three credit, gain six, and you know, tutor out a more useful card is just bonkers value for op. It is just incredibly powerful. Hedge fund, I would love to cut. You just kind of need some early econ though. Manning we've talked about. Virus, we've talked about. Takana, we've talked about. Vovo is the kind of pet card of mine that I think does more work than it first appears, um, but is definitely a little bit of a fun include. And I would expect when people improve on this list, finding a better use for this last two influence will be part of it. That said, I think Vovo gives you a lot of reach. This deck plays very low on credits. And generally, I was finding in games where I got Vovo on the board, he was worth plus three credits at minimum. And then the runner had to trash him. So to some extent, a five credit swing, which is pretty good for a single card in this list. So that's kind of the whole list. The idea here is not that we're going to try and build impenetrable scoring remotes consistently. It's that we're going to try and pressure the runner by going fast and being precise with our threats, but then recognizing when we are ahead, how we play to not lose. This is the thing I talk about a lot on my stream about playing as the runner and often the way to win as the runner is just to continually make the play that prevents you from losing over and over and over again. With this corp, we're trying to actually actively win, but the thing we have to always remember is that Central pressure actually spiked way up in the Automata initiative. I think basically the rotation of hard-hitting news meant that low-value runs on centrals became much more powerful and much less low-value because that's where agendas end up being a lot of the time. And so Sable, Conduit, uh, Deep Dive, Stargate, uh, and even cards like Hermes end up making central accesses really, really strong. And so um, you want to make sure that you are reasonably protected and that it's costing the runner a good amount. Now, a lot of the ice in this deck is a little bit closer to what we call a gear check ice that just says, do you have your breaker? But this is where cards like Sandstone, Magnet, Hordum, and even Stavka in certain situations can really pull their weight. Where the, and it, honestly, Envelopment on a Sentinel has been pretty good for me, and you'll see me do it twice in this replay that's coming up. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not over committing on your remote and you are always pushing to go for wins. But without further ado, let's go into this replay. This is just a replay against a random person on JNet. I've scrubbed their name and their identifying information. They're going to show up here as villain uh, in the logs. And I'm just going to walk you through what honestly is like kind of the generic game plan where my opponent plays reasonably, maybe not the most challenging lines at all time, but generally pretty good lines. So this hand is a little bit awkward. I think I end up keeping it because against criminal, you can do a lot worse. Um, you know, we have three good cards. Stavka is actually a fourth good card to find pretty early. The half run is pretty awkward. I'm probably going to want to try and recycle it back into my deck at some point, um, but it is what it is. If I don't draw this Azef protocol, I'm super happy. I go for what is a actually pretty risky line against Criminal, all things considered. Um, I triple, I do the double ice and put the Rashida down. Um, Criminal is probably the only matchup where this is a risky turn one play. If I'm not up against Criminal, if I'm up against Anarch or Shaper, I am probably doing this double install, clicking for a credit. The ice on HQ is almost more valuable to me as buffer in my hand to prevent them from scoring the Azef. And I'm really all in on, I'm not all in, but I'm really trying to get this Rashida to fire. Against Criminal though, if they hit me with a diversion of funds and then run the remote, which is a play that's completely open and available to them here, I'm gonna be pretty sad. Um, 
So the runner plays Falsified, sees it's a Rashida. I'm just going to res it now. And then they do what is also a really good play against this deck. There's not really bad face checks against this. So this white space is probably the worst one. And so I just basically res a three cost Hordem. And now my HQ is completely open. And this is the kind of danger thing. If my opponent has a pinhole threading, I'm set back a ton of tempo. But I want to be a little bit aggressive. If I can get an early lead, if I can get away with an early Rashida fire or an early agenda score, it lets me really ease up on the gas because I'm putting a lot of implicit pressure on the runner. Um, oh, can I like play with court view maybe so I don't see? Uh, no, let's just go back to spectator view. So this Rashida draw is actually kind of awkward. Uh, I would have liked to have found actual money. Um, and actually my mandatory draw, I basically do find actual money. So I will have a two ice server here and I can, I'm actually, okay, so my initial thinking when looking at that hand was like, oh, I can try and score the Oak Town. The problem is there's still pretty annoying lines where the runner just blows me out by just playing a blind diversion on HQ. And then something like Boomerang Server 1 and I'm, I'm completely dead. Um, And so I, I do the slightly slower play of if I can bait them into running with the Manic Arm Skunk Works, that's probably going to come out well for me. But now I have a lot of time. My cards in hand are not great. I'm a little bit flooded, so I'm just going to try and start pushing. Um, I think the other reason to not just do Border Control, push the Oak Town is it's not, yeah, I, it, arguably you can do it. I think it would have been probably fine as well. So there's some risks here. My opponent uh, could like install Hermes and start running and creating a lot of problems for me. Um, and actually, my run my opponent finds the right line, which is get Amakua up to strength four. That means that Hordem can now get broken by Amakua, and uh, and start making runs. Now this is where I'm talking about like this is a tempo deck. I'm trying to keep ahead of the runner's tempo. And part of what that is, is their ability to make successful runs. And on three credits, it is quite difficult for them to do a lot of damage to me. Now, I could res the Managarm here, let them have the Oak Town, and then I get to keep the Managarm, uh, and they get an agenda, and they have two clicks left to work with. I don't love that when I can pop the Border Control and actually get a Mavirus here. The Mavirus will let me search for a Tukana next turn. Um, if they let me get away with it. They can uh, actually just run back at the Hordem, uh, let me, and then I have to purge and I don't get them a virus trigger. I think though, if they go for a, actually, I don't even have to do that because I can just res the Manic Arm Skunk Works. That was why I did this play. Um, Manic Arm Skunk Works at this point is actually a hard lockout. Um, and this is what I mean about Managarm being a little bit of a force multiplier. It doesn't have to always guarantee a safe agenda score, but it opens up these windows where you can score safely. Um, and now my opponent puts down a Hermes. Um, I'm pretty happy that this is how this thing works out because now I can go and get the Jakana, advance the Oak Town, score, trigger Jakana to put a Magnet on R&D. I grab Magnet here because there's not much more value out of it and getting a three strength code gate on the field is pretty good. My opponent's gonna bounce the after back to my hand and I'm just gonna put that back on the field. Um, I discard the audacity here. I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, it's hard because it's probably the worst card in my hand, but it's also a pretty critical card for winning in the late game. But I sort of need credits now and I just hope I'll draw a spin doctor to get the audacity back. Um, because it is one of the best ways to score out against criminals in the end game. This is also why I care a lot about having two strength ice is because with them a virus in archives, criminal can still run archives and get to a single virus, a single strength on Amakua. So Afshar is a little bit awkward because it is that one strength and it probably could be replaced with an enigma. Um, here I have a couple of options. I don't really want to go for a push here, though I arguably could. Runner's going to start their turn on four credits and six cards in hand, so they might actually be looking to kind of play aggressively here. Um, so I could potentially go something like install above the law, click for a credit, hedge fund, and I think that might even be what I do. 
Okay, I actually ice up uh, HQ because my opponent's playing criminal. They haven't played a diversion of funds yet. We're playing a low credit scrappy game. And so they're going, and they're stable. So at some point, their game guarantee is going to involve running on HQ. Basically nothing they can do about that. Um, here they go for a bravado. I read the Stavka and I have no cards I particularly want to trash and the pl that I can search for another card. And so there's not much point to trash anything because the Amakua cannot get there. Um, my opponent responds to this correctly, which is, okay, well, uh, I'll just go all the way through. I definitely could res the Afshar here. The reason I didn't was basically I want, I now have a scoring window. My opponent has to find a breaker and a solution for Hordom and potentially a solution for this border control. And so if I can... Uh, keep my credits up, that's fine. And with two agendas in hand, I'm probably gonna be able to keep them. Uh, my opponent does the smart thing and says, hey, your trash subroutine, trash, trash ice install program subroutines do nothing if I have no programs and you're not seeming to willing to res the HQ ice, so let me just go up to 15 credits real fast. This is what makes playing tempo corpse really hard. Bravado fucking sucks when you're trying to tempo. It just r changes the entire tempo equation of making runs. My opponent now goes for a single ice on R and D, a single axis on R and D, with a Mercury down. So they're actually putting a lot of threat on us and on me. So I go, okay, I am ahead right now. I've trashed their uh, their first Amakua. I have lots of barriers in hand. I don't have a lot of credits, but my runner, my opponent's not putting a lot of threat on me right now. So I can just put some ice up. And, and stay calm, and I'll be able to make some plays in the near future. I wanna just deny single accesses so that I don't lose the, the time I spent installing that ice, and I draw into an extract, which is fantastic. Just gonna click for three credits this turn. We're gonna you know, let it be. My opponent's gonna say, okay, you're not putting pressure on me. I'm gonna keep setting up, right? I'm gonna go from having very few credits to drawing lots of cards and dripping for lots of credits. Make me do something which is the correct response for them. And now I get to go, okay, I really need some money. We're going to extract the magnet, get the regolith mining license, uh, and we're gonna click it two times. I think there's actually a world where I click this regolith mining license once and then just install above the law. I have a lot of good targets for above the law. Uh, my opponent's probably not gonna be able to contest the server uh, and I don't really need the remaining credits, but you know, this isn't a terrible play either. My opponent just says, hey, you're not putting real pressure on me. I'm just gonna keep setting up. So now I'm gonna click Regolith once, install over the agenda, and then ice put another ice back onto R&D. Because the way I'm gonna lose this game is not my opponent busting the remote. Border control, mana garm, just make this server so difficult to get into already. Uh, they need a lot of credits, they need all of their breakers down. They do have two out of their three, but you know, that's okay. Um, and if they have a trick, like they can't really border control and get into this remote. This game though is an example of why I want a third sandstone. Uh, I have, I've just naturally drawn into two of my sandstones. So this border control actually doesn't have a correct target on this board state. And you probably want to minimize the number of times that happens. Um, opponent's just going to doof me, and there's not really, to me, a point to resing the Afshar. It just drains me of three credits that I probably don't care about. Um, and I get to just score above the law. I end up targeting this backstitching because I figure it's going to slow them down the most. And I use this to counter res to get an envelopment on archives. Basically, I am anticipating that my opponent is on deep dive, and they can win off of firing two deep dives or just running centrals a bit or busting my remote once and then firing a deep dive and getting lucky on a central. And so just saying, it's got, got, got to go find those breakers. I now have a barrier on two different servers. So you really need lots of tricks. I've stranded your boomerang, so to speak. So I've got options. Um, the other nice thing is this gets around to Kana in a lot of ways. Still not much point to resing. My economy is pretty bad. And now my opponent has a, a Kupira out and I'm a little bit sad. But, you know, if my opponent's gonna play a low base strength barrier fractor, well, let's just put some sandstones back on R&D. 
I could go for a push here, but on 19 credits, I'm actually not super secure in this remote yet. Uh, I want them to kind of spend down a bit um, or get myself just in a slightly better position. And so now um, I can get rid of the stop cut. It's not really gonna do anything for me. I can put them a virus in server one. I can install some ice and I can put an agenda down. Um, my opponent's gonna run and I'm gonna just go, Ooh, this is gonna get a little bit hairy, uh, but I have just enough credits. Um, the Movirus Ret tutor is because I didn't actually have other good tutors in my list at this point. Um, and so what I do here is a little bit funky. I trash the Movirus first to get white space so that um, this run will be more taxing for the runner the next time they go through. Then I'll pop the border control. I actually have no three cost targets left in my list. So I'm just trying to make the runner spend down um, and go now that I'm at threat four, which this deck can get to pretty quickly. Uh, Shibboleth is down to a pretty low base strength. So spending six to break Hordom is pretty good for me. I can now res the Managarm. And in theory, yes, Formicary would be good, but I haven't, there'd be nowhere I, no turn I would have wanted to install the Formicary here. And this is kind of my thesis with this deck is I just don't really want to install the Formicary. And if Formicary is res, I don't get to use its ability. Um, my opponent has barely enough credits to do anything. I actually can use and this is maybe a little bit greedy. I use my last two credits to get the envelopment uh, onto HQ. So I'm just extreme, it's extremely obnoxious for my opponent to get in anywhere. Because I don't trash the Manic Arm and I top deck another Oak Town, I can just Oak Town, click for a credit, advance the Oak Town, which is just like, like the kind of root play this deck goes for. It says, yeah, you can steal some of my agendas, but you can't steal, I can probably score four of them before you can. Uh, and so I just get to power up. And now I'm on six points. I've got two hostiles still in the deck and I shuffled back the audacity with my spin doctor. So I have lots of great draws. Um, I'm just gonna put a border control on R and D. This is gonna slow down my opponent's ability to deep dive me. Um, they do recover, right? Like I've been saying, runners can recover credits really quickly. I put the Rashida down, not because I expect to land a Rashida, but because I want to slow down the runner some more, similarly with this ice on archives. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that my opponent didn't actually try and contest this remote. It only costs them one, uh, four. I mean, it does actually cost them quite a bit, right? It costs them probably five. So it costs them nine credits, and then they also have to deal with a manic arm. Now, the thing is, this is if this is a 3-2, I just win the game. And maybe they're saying, oh, it's there's no world in which it's a 3-2, but it's bad enough anyway. It's a Rashida, and I draw, and I can win in either of two ways. And so this is the basic game plan of the deck. It's not, oh, I build a super remote that's impossible to get into. It's, you know, the idea here is I'm trying to make it just slightly too expensive for the runner to go in. Or if they can get in, they probably can't get in twice. So uh, I'm not gonna go over the games uh, on the stream, um, but uh, I think those games against CTZ and Ian were very good examples of that. Um, and um, I'm not gonna go over the actual cut games that were on stream where I got to play this, this uh, op list. Um, I think if you go back, the game against CTC was great. The game against Rongi Doge was fantastic. I did actually goof up a winning line in the final turn, or my final turn, what ended up being my final turn. Uh, so you can go back and watch that. Um, but uh, I think this list is really cool because while it looks like a weird combo op lord list, it's actually just good. It's more or less good, clean Netrunner. And so, you know, when we look at what this list evolved to in the following week at, um, or maybe not evolved to, maybe that's giving myself too much credit. Uh, but when we look at the op list that NWE brought, uh, those were very heavy in calibration testing, kind of leaning more into the three cost search for a Dukana combo. Um, and this to me is like, in a lot of ways, what I feel like Netrunner is about, which is out-tempoing your opponent 
and playing this game that's like this constant cat and mouse give and take of tempo and there are styles of runners that can steamroll you um lat and like the like control shaper lists that are running clot simul chip you know buzzsaw cleaver turbine echelon uh or you know they substitute in some number of shaper breakers in there um those can be really really hard matchups if you don't get a strong early start and if you do if they do get the lock set up sometimes you need to like sneak them a virus by them so that you can fast advance out for a win or that's where envelopment can start to really shine where it becomes this really obnoxious piece of ice they have to deal with over and over again same with uh sandstone so like this list is not perfect it's not great against every single runner deck but i think in general it's pretty good against criminal i think in general it's pretty good against anarch and i think it plays at least even with shaper and to be honest a lot of shaper decks are struggling with other matchups right now so i wouldn't be surprised if shaper still kept back a little bit or left to the people that are diehard shaper players and i found this list to be a lot of fun against basically every runner in the field where you have to make correct decisions you have to make a lot of correct decisions um, but runners also will make lots of incorrect decisions against you because the Stavka threat is so big on their tempo. The border control tempo swings are really in your favor. Um, so yeah, this has been my deep dive on uh, bathtub water. I hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and uh, I hope to see you out in the uh, out slinging this deck or something like it in the near future.